Welcome. Welcome to our first Facebook Live event and welcome to our clinic. I'm Dr. Kristen Finn and this is my dog Spring and this is my uh, model Baxter. We are so excited to be able to share what we wanted to share with you without putting anyone in danger of the virus. So we're going to talk about a few things um, to help your dog live an excellent prolonged life full of mobility. I am the veterinarian that owns this practice. I'm certified in acupuncture, chiropractic, and physical therapy or canine rehabilitation. We also have on our team Cassie Swafford who's a doctor of physical therapy but also trained in canine physical therapy. So amongst the services that we offer are chiropractic, acupuncture, laser therapy, warm water hydrotherapy, and stem cell, just to name a few. Our practice focus is mobility, pain, and arthritis, and lameness. So if your dog's having trouble moving, we're the team for you. So um, we're going to start with some fun facts about the dog's skeleton and function, the way their bodies function, which will explain why I made the bold statement um, as the title of this presentation, help your dog move better at any age pain-free. It's a pretty bold statement, as I said, but I firmly believe that every single dog regardless of age, injury, or previous surgeries can move better than they're moving now without any pain. So we'll get to our skeleton here. Um, and I have Spring here, one, because he's a super good dog and he's a, a fun little sidekick. And so Spring is 81 pounds. Um, he's actually a little smaller than um, this skeleton dog would be if he was the whole entire dog. So Spring, let's stand up. Oh, stand up, Spring. Jesus, I was told to lay. Come on, bud. Nice. So, so he's 81 pounds, and this skeleton was probably a 110-pound dog. Probably had a bit of sighthound in them, um, greyhound, a little bit taller. But you can see the difference between the skeleton and this um, dog with all his hip, with all his muscles, tendon, of course, hair. Sit spring. Um, there, good boy. So the, this was to help exemplify, you stay there, that the skeleton is a minor part of the whole picture of the dog. The skeleton only counts for 15% by mass of the dog. So Spring is 81 pounds. If you took all of his bones and put them in one little pile, it would only weigh 12 pounds. So that's a very minor part of the whole picture. Come on, Spring, let's get over here. So the reason that that is good news is because the muscles and ligaments and tendons account for 65% of the dog. So those are structures that we can continue to help and improve for as long as your dog is alive. So to me, that's the most fantastic news of all. We can't make arthritis go away. We're not claiming to cure arthritis, but arthritis is, is a bone. It's a bone problem. And bones don't move bones. Muscles and soft tissue, like tendons, move the bones. So if we can strengthen the muscles and the tendons, then they will support the joints and move the bones, and thereby decreasing pain by giving stability to the joint and preventing the exacerbation of arthritis. So we have a joint here, and this is a stifle joint. Many people are familiar with it. I'm sure a bunch of you in the, uh, in the viewing audience 
have had a dog with an ACL or a cruciate injury. That's the, the bane of everyone's existence. So this, this femur, the upper bone, and this piece of the tibia, okay spring sit, um, would be about the size of spring. And this is that same joint with some of the ligaments on the outside. So if you imagine that this is all the size of his bone would be, all the rest of him, now we finally want you to stand. That's all, all the rest of it is muscle. He happens to be very well muscled and very fit. He spent a lot of his day running around. He's a seven year old dog, so he's pretty young. But if he didn't have strong muscles, this joint would be vulnerable to hypermobility and strain of the ligaments, which are actually inside the joint. Okay. So regardless of your dog's age, fitness is a big part of their having happy, mobile life and quality of life. So that's what we really are going to talk about today. We've got our what I call fun facts, meaning, you know, and I think they're power facts because you know, you have the power to help their soft tissue gain strength and flexibility, thereby decreasing their pain and improving their mobility, which since a dog's life is defined by their movement, um, that gives them more life. Okay. And I forgot to mention, if you have any questions, please um, type your questions in the comments below. And then my assistant, Kendall, will be uh, gathering those questions and will intermittently um, break for those questions because I really want to answer the questions that you have. Do we have any questions yet, Kendall? Um, yeah, we can go over a few. Okay, questions. let's go through some of our questions. Um, so one of the questions we had was, um, somebody was wondering, when is it a good time to start therapy for their dog? So that's an excellent question. Thank you. So basically, you know, if you're talking about fitness exercises, you start when they're puppies. And there's many breeders that have objects for the puppies to climb on or little obstacle courses for the puppies to go through. But you need to get getting strong with good balance from the time that you start to be weaned and moving about. And if you think about wild animals, they need to, once they leave the den, they need to be able to catch their food and avoid predators. So basically, bottom line is, as soon as you get your dog, I'm sure it's time to start doing things, whether that be just walking or climbing over things or going through tubes or this ladder exercise. We're going to go over this ladder exercise because it's my favorite exercise. And no matter how young or how old, there's many reasons why that's good. And we'll, we'll get to those. Another question uh, we had was, is there any um, activity, whether it be play or um, like agility or anything, that you would consider is not so good for the dog's body? Absolutely, and I have this chuck it instrument, and I hope I don't get a lawsuit over it, but this is the worst thing on the planet for a dog. Sometimes I nickname it a cruciate maker um, because there's so many dogs who sit at home all day. They're not fit, they're not supple, they're not stretched out. And then a super well-meaning owner comes home and chucks the ball 50 or 80 yards. And then they take off and they tear their cruciates. And it breaks my heart because I know the owner would never want to do that. So I, I disdain the chuck it. And um, some dogs love to chase. Uh, most dogs love to chase. They want to chase the ball. And so I just say, change the game. So all dogs should have a sit-stay. 
spring has a very good sit stay. He just doesn't have a sit still stay. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the, we practiced this earlier, so he's kind of burned out from it. But um, it's fantastic to put your dog in a sit stay, throw your ball or your stick, and then release them, and then they're chasing it. They watched it, but they're not going after something that's bouncing or moving. They don't skid to a stop in the same way um, that injures knee um, joints as well as multiple other joints, jams their thoracic inlet by and their toes by pouncing on the moving ball. Dogs tend not to pounce on things that aren't moving. They may excitedly, you know, have their descent of speed and when they stop, but it's not the same as if it's moving. So that was actually one of the topics that I wanted to bring up because it, it breaks my heart when well-meaning owners inadvertently set their dog up for an injury. Throwing the dog, if it's a water dog, you can throw that ball or stick once they're in the water. Then they're not taking off from the land, but they're getting to purely swim after their, their ball or stick. Um, and then I might as well um, jump to what it, the, another way that I have people change the game is by making it a game that's more aligned with the dog's psyche. Dogs are meant to spend a good amount of every day with their nose to the ground and smelling. Temple Grandin and some other researchers call smelling or sniffing or the seeking behavior. And when an animal is, a dog is seeking, they are releasing different hormones in their brain, serotonin and other calming hormones, and is more interesting and more satisfying to them. Obviously, I have golden retrievers. They will chase something that is thrown over and over, and it's never enough. But if you hide the ball or make a track for them or a nose work game, I know there's a lot of you that do nose work, they get done and they're like, huh, they're satisfied. And, and we all want to satisfy our dogs. So I apologize if I got a little high on my soapbox, but um, it's an everyday issue um, in our office is how do we deal with changing the game. Dogs are very adaptable to new games. Humans have a super hard time. And I'm sorry, gentlemen, men have a very, very hard time changing the game. But um, it's really good for your dog. Start being more creative. Give them the credit for, for being pretty smart and versatile. But the transitions from a down to a stand or a sit or a stand to a down are one of the first things that we start to notice when our dog is having discomfort. You know, and they don't wake up in the morning and say, oh my God, my aching back. But they show it in the difficulty of their transitions. So, and we all, our dogs, ourselves, have what we call the kisses of life. The wear and tear that we incur getting through life, even if we didn't have a massive trauma or what, weren't hit by a car, um, it's still the wear and tear of life. And so um, we recommend, you know, massage. I, at the end of this, we'll be kind of introducing passive range of motion. Um, passive range of motion is there's, um, it's on the homepage of my website. There's two videos, one with this guy, um, and one with a very old, an older infirmed um, dog. Um, and that's to give you good examples. So that's something that we will get to at the end. In, any dog, regardless of age, will benefit from that. We have a lot of 17, 15 year old dogs that come here. We we do some manual therapy, some massage, some body work, whatever they need to um, to keep their bodies supple and moving. As well as we have these little obstacle courses with simple exercises. We're going to go over two of them today, three of them today, actually. 
and it just kind of keeps them going, keeps them having a slight challenge without exhausting them. I'm not trying to get this dog to hike Mount Sai. I just want to keep them moving through the house comfortably. So we will, we will touch on that, but absolutely, any dog, any age. Okay, we're good to go. So um, let's see. Lots, um, okay, and then that, that brings me to my statement of, you know, increasing fitness, muscle strength, and proprioception or balance. So this is for humans as well as dogs that um, that will help as you move through life prevent injury. Kind of one of the Cassie's expressions that she uses in the physical therapy world is, you know, train your balance before you fall because you fall and you break things. And dogs don't tend to break things when they fall, but they strain things and they strain ligaments because the surrounding muscles um, haven't been supporting them. So we'll move on to a couple of the exercises that we were talking about that anybody can do. And I told there's a couple of Home Depots where the gentlemen are willing to cut the PVC for you. Um, and so this is our, our baby ladder, we call it. It's for little dogs and, um, and very old dogs that are infirmed. And then, you know, we have the standard ladder there, or you can make a PVC ladder, which we do have one um, that's bigger. There just wasn't room for it right now. So let's have a nice, gentle dismount spring, and he will show you. Come on. Very good. Okay, right there. So this is very simple. Come on, friend. Just walking through the ladder slowly. That ladder is obviously easy for him to do. Good boy. So the ladder does a couple of things that are highly beneficial. We, um, they have to flex through their tarsus, stifle, and hip. So all those joints have to flex to step over the rung. Obviously, a little dog or an infirm dog, a stiff dog, an arthritic dog, um, we wouldn't ask them, we don't want to challenge them or overface them, but we just want to give them some exercise. So we have Pomeranians um, as, uh, that we work with, that uh, Chihuahuas, that have no problem with this small ladder. The goal of the ladder is only walking. It's not an accomplishment when you can trot through the ladder. So we only want to walk through it. One, another benefit of the ladder is you can't pace through a ladder. You have to have normal gait mechanics of the walk, whether we're in a little ladder or the big ladder. So typically, we have people have their dog walk through the appropriate size ladder twice a day, two times. So if you put it where you go for a walk, you walk out your door, walk through your ladder, go on your walk, whether it's small or big, and then come back through your ladder. Or we have several people that have them in their garage for the winter or, um, or a hallway, somewhere where you can't possibly trip over it at night because that would also break my heart. But dogs will troll their ladder whether if it's set out, whether you're asking them to or not, the way you teach a dog to go through the ladder, if you know they're nervous, we have lots of dogs that will leap from side to side, and then and then we just let them do that because they're getting more comfortable with the ladder, and then eventually they figure out it's easier to just walk through it. But we put snacks in the ladder, which Spring had a, a million times. Come here, friend. So, and dogs, of course, they assume that we are forgetful and will leave a treat in the ladder. So this is how we start introducing them if they haven't ever done it and they're nervous. Kendall and Alex are fantastic at squeaking and making the ladder seem like the most amazing fun thing. So 
we just put little treats, you know, he, this is dog food, so he's willing to work for anything. And it doesn't matter that he's moving very slowly as I'm talking, he's still doing the activity. And just like the slot machine that we do just in case we win money someday, a dog will keep looking through it and walking through it. So that's rehab that you don't have to do the work. So either doing it on the beginning of your walk or just occasionally putting a snack in there, that'll get them trolling the ladder for weeks to months. So simple exercise, um, good for them them figuring out their balance, their proprioception, where's my feet in space and time, not that they consciously say, oh, I'm hitting the rungs, but they won't want to hit the rungs, and then you know, oh, they're having proprioceptive difficulties, we need to work on more balance. Any questions popping up with that? Um, yeah, we got a, a, a couple of questions here. Somebody was wondering, um, if they don't have a ladder at home and can't be out the whole people right now, we're a lot of things. Good question. So when I was first starting the rehab aspect of the practice, um, I uh, I didn't have a small ladder, so I used the broom, the mop, the duster, a paper, uh, what, wrapping paper roll. So I just use things. You can use two by fours or one by ones, anything, and just lay them down. And it's a great stuck at home exercise, which, you know, I had to do at one point. It, it took a while to get all this stuff together. So um, fantastic question. Thank you. Um, and then the other one that just was popping up here um, is Right, right. Raising the ladder off the ground or using something like cavaletti is still beneficial. Um, again, great question. And you guys are a fantastic um, audience. It's really helping me out. Um, so raising a ladder, the only ladder that I raised um, is I'll sometimes raise the small ladder. And like I, my sister has a French bulldog and they don't flex their legs. There's a lot of dogs that just kind of move and their legs are hardly bending. But he's a big enough French Bulldog that having this low ladder still didn't get him to flex his legs. So we raised it, I think, one and a half to two inches. But um, Cataletti's, a fantastic exercise for some things, are a different exercise. So this is a what in the equine world, which was my world for, for 25 years, um, we had ground poles that were to walk over, and then we had cavalettis that um, were for trotting over. So um, a dog that is stiff in their joints and is not having proper mechanics of their pelvis shouldn't be trotting in cavalettis. Um, they need to start with the basic. In our practice, we have dogs that come, of course, of all levels. We have dogs that are nationally competitive in sports, and we have our 15 and 17 year olds that we adore, and um, and then everything in between. And so sometimes, or young dogs that are getting their muscle and their gates are, you know, they're meant to be show dogs, and their gates are are not ideal. So we may start with ground poles for getting forelimb extension and, and flexion of the hind limbs, and then move on to adding some cavalettis for different things about their gait and different fitness. Um, and then I just had one other person ask a question. Um, they were just saying that their dog who's four years old is just four, um, four is just predisposed um, to having cruciate issues. Um, and so they were just wondering, is the um, ladder exercise and some of the other exercise that we can do um, beneficial and help preventing those injuries? Um, great question. Um, I guess my one question, which is maybe you can answer quickly, what about your dog is making them prone to cruciate? Is that that they're heavy? Is that they're a very straight-legged dog or that they already kind of strain their cruciate? Um, so that would um, give me more information to give you more information. 
But two things about cruciates um, that we always say. One, yes, the latter in most cases is going to be ideal because you're going to be strengthening that quadricep and the hamstring is the opposing muscle. And those are the muscles that on the upper part of the limb help support the cruciate. Uh, the knee. We want to make them as strong as possible without being tight. A tight muscle is a weak muscle and most dogs that have had one cruciate um, have gotten very tight in the opposite leg, the supporting leg, and then nobody addresses that leg and surgeons do beautiful surgery, but no one addresses the other leg and that's why there's a 60 to 80 percent chance that they will injure the other leg. In our world, we have a very low incidence of injuring the second leg because we address those soft tissues of the supporting leg from the very beginning. Because we work with braces and post-surgical, and so that's my primary goal um, when I'm rehabbing a cruciate, is not only do I want to rehab the leg that just got the brace or had the surgery, but I want to rehab the leg that's been picking up the slack, as well as their spine. So when a leg is sore, you offload that leg and curve the spine. And so you fix this leg, but if no one worked on your spine, then it's also still making you prone to injury or a back strain. Um, so the other thing is not really the subject of this talk, but um, one of my many soapboxes that um, in our culture, we are collagen deficient and dogs are collagen deficient, deficient sorry, unless they're eating whole prey because there's no collagen, which is the proteins that make up the ligaments or the building blocks for ligaments and joints. There is no collagen in kibble at all, and there's no collagen in a lot of the raw foods um, if they don't have tendon ligament as part of that mix. You know, I um, I really enjoy feeding chicken feet as well as collagen powder is something that we carry. But we're deficient too uh, because we don't eat the whole animal. We're meant to eat the whole animal. So we have a easily dissolvable collagen and I drink it in my coffee every day because it doesn't taste like anything. So the, um, you know, we'd be happy to help you um, answer some more questions. You can feel free to call our office and everybody on the staff knows all our spiels about cruciates. Um, it's such a big part of our practice. Sometimes we see four to five to six a day. Um, which is epidemic in my mind, and we have to be doing a better job. Uh, um, just some follow-up information okay. um, from that person. Um, they were saying that it is a Bernese Mountain Dog, and um, they were just saying that um, this dog's mother and grandmother blew both of their cruciates. Oh, so. Perfect, and I work on a lot of Bernese Mountain Dogs, and um, Oftentimes they're overweight. There, a lot of them. I know there's a Berman group watching this, so I don't want to um, misspeak. But I observe that there's a lot of them that are fairly straight in their posture. Some of them, it's posture, not confirmation. If you can fix it or make it better, then it's not confirmation. So they tend to have their pelvises um, a little bit tilted forward which makes their knees straighter um, and uh, you know I um, a lot of them are not getting collagen um, and so I don't think that it's so much that the line is genetically predisposed um, but that their breed tendencies and um, so many folks don't really keep their burners as fit as they could be. You know, they're happy to, a burner would have been happy to lay here the entire time. Um, they're super wonderful dogs, but they need to be fit just as much as a Labrador does. But for sure, I'd start with the latter and with the collagen. And um, just let us know if we can help you further. Okay, so where were we? So we got our ladder exercise, and then 
we'll move to spring. Um, one of the other exercises, simple at home, um, come on friends, that anybody can do in their living room, especially when they're stuck at home. So these are, we call them squishy mats. So um, if there's nothing special about it, it's not marketed as a squishy mat. These are just different thicknesses of mats that take a little more balance and strength. It's like walking at the beach. It's harder to walk in deep sand than sand close to the shore that's got a lot of water and it's nicely firmly packed. So a um, couple of things about the squishy mat is you have to have more strength to step out of a squish and take a step forward. And then you have to have the proof receptors, the balance um, organs in your joints activated and balanced. So proprioception and strength um, are big ones. And you can just put this, so this is a dog bed, that's just a workout mat, and that's an old camp mat. Just a few things we had. You can use couch cushions, you can use multiple dog beds in a row. And then the idea is just, come here, string. This is obviously easy for him. Oh, yeah. All right, let's just walk through the squishy mat. And you can see that the thinner mat is pretty easy for him. Um, but you can just set it in a doorway, uh, any, any squishy mat. The other thing is, um, there's in this setup, we had different heights and different textures. So it would be like if we were walking through a room that had all different stuff in it. It would be a balance challenge as well as um, a strength challenge. So for instance, um, we had a dear, our, our last 17 year old that just went to heaven. Um, she was coming here up until two weeks before she went to heaven. And we would set up that smaller squishy mat and this ladder, and actually this step that Spring is standing on, we would set it up as an obstacle course. So we have it set up so she would go little squishy mat, little ladder, little squishy mat, and a step up. And we put some treats in, and then she'd come, and we, you know, her owner would open the door, and she learned after the first week what it was all about. And so it was like she was coming to the gym um, once a week and she would put her head down and she would do her little things and then we'd go back and forth about four reps, then a little manual therapy session and a few more reps and it really kept her very, very strong. You know, she went to heaven because, um, you know, her liver and kidney had decided they, they had enough, but her muscles were strong and she was still going on walks. Um, so this is uh, one of those exercises that Spring has offered us. Um, again, simple. So we have three exercises and then we're going to show you passive range of motion. So this is what we call front paws up. And these, um, it's, it has to, it's important or helpful if you do it correctly. So he offered to have his front paws up but you can see that all his weight is on the front end. He has fairly straight shoulders, but I want to strengthen his hind end. So I'm just gonna, um, there you go, kind of push him so he shifts back so his weight is on his hind end. This isn't a very big challenge for him because it's only four inches. But for 17-year-old Abby, it was a big challenge. She could not do four inches. That was, um, or six inches. So taller was uncomfortable for her, but this was very comfortable for her. You can have those. And, and the other thing is when they're stretching up, like Abby was stretching up, she was opening her hip flexors and then shifting onto her hinds. And um, that was, um, increasing her strength and helping her translating for to her having good walks around the block. So come forward. So this is a more appropriate height for spring. 
and it's easier to shift him to his hind end and then strengthen the quads. And because he's well muscled, I don't know how the light is for you guys, but you can actually see his hamstring muscle and it helps he's intact. So he has good, um, he's not fertile, but he's intact. So that really has helped his muscles, which is, I don't know if the burner was a male or female, but I would be really cognizant of when you um, alter them because they really need their hormones to get proper muscle strength and development. Okay, back up to me. So this front paws up, for some dogs, that small height is going to be very appropriate. That just happens to be an aerobic step that we glued spring um, yoga mat on. And this is just a little step that we have in the clinic. You can use anything. You can use a piece of lumber. Just make sure it's not slick and um, not moving like this. He's unusual in the fact that he's not scared to step on something that moves and that it's appropriate. We're not trying to make your dog get to the Olympics. We don't want to make it hard for them. If they do it and they can only do it for a second, then it's probably too hard to lower it. And then over time, as we consistently see with dogs that have injuries or issues, okay, well, we'll start with 12 inches. This is 13 inches. Um, and then, oh, in a few months, now we can do higher um, in, a, in a dog who's not, you know, very geriatric. Um, and then we just keep records of all that. And then they're happy to, happy to do that. So normally the way we do these front paws up when we find appropriate sizes, we give the instructions as reps. So two or three reps for 10 to 20 seconds, um, three to, uh, twice a day. And it depends on the dog. I mean, this dog um, runs uh, in our, on our property, which is 18 acres. He probably runs about six miles a day, just when I'm feeding the horses. He, he climbs on logs. And so, you know, he's, he's a very fit dog. But um, well, we have, we saw a few dogs today and yesterday that this was actually hard for them. So we, we went to a smaller size. I think we ended up at six inches. So those are, those are simple things that anyone can do of any dog of any age. So there's a lot, there's hundreds of PT exercises or fitness exercises. Some of them are appropriate for some dogs and others are not. So given that I'm not seeing the dogs, um, these are these are three that no matter what, if you pick the right size and the right um, thickness of your squishy mat, um, they'll be appropriate. Perfect. So now just kind of move these ladders. We're going to talk about passive range of motion, and then Spring and I will get down here. Move up, friend. And Spring has had to do this a million times because that video that's on my website, it was about seven takes because I really wanted to get it as perfect as I could. Uh, right. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing because, like I said, there's two videos on my website. Spring down. Oh. Down. Go ahead, go away. But passive range of motion is just that. It's passive, meaning, oh, good boy. We're not trying to reach a particular degree of flexibility. We're just trying to relax our dog. There is it's very few dogs, a um, couple of Malamutes, a few Huskies, that are um, tough cells as far as as body work or massage or passive range of motion. But um, we actually had a Husky in today who's actually become, her both her dogs, Husky Crosses, have become really enamored with massage. But we had to start not with our agenda, 
but with what do they want. So, um, despite the video and the instructions, um, I would use it as a guide, but, you know, we always say, which is not in the video, every dog loves a brain massage for the most part. There's going to be an exception out there. So I'm just rubbing his head and his ears, and he finds that relaxing. He's a gold retriever, so they find every, every ridgeback cross. So they find everything relaxing. But just starting with laying down with them, massaging them. Very few dogs on the planet that wouldn't like this. And then you start doing your range of motion, which again is, is um, demonstrated in that video. And just, you know, what would what looks like it feels good. Your dog is never gonna lie to make you feel good. That um, they're, they're absolutely honest. So if your dog is closing their eyes or slowing down or relaxing, you're doing it right. Don't try to accomplish anything. You're just rubbing and mobilizing. There you go. Oh, he says, well, I think I would, I would like my back rubbed. And so this is all regardless of age. Everybody should do this. You can do it for two minutes. You can do it for one minute. You can do it while you're watching TV. But just light massage, no deep tissue. Don't do deep tissue on your dogs. They cannot possibly make the leap that you're hurting me now so I can feel better later. Um, they are all about the now and how are you making me feel. And so trust your intuition if you have, if you feel like this is what it really seems like but it doesn't make sense, then you're going to be right. But if you're like, oh, I really dug in there and I'm really getting in there and I'm, you know, that's, that's the wrong answer. Please don't do that. Um, the fascia, which covers all of the muscles, um, does not need to be screamed at. And that's pretty simple, huh? So that gives you a good start. Um, I have a summary of, of this talk and, um, I would love to email it to anyone that's interested. Um, so just go ahead and leave um, your emails. You can call our office. Our office um, phone number is 360-297-3323. Um, and our email is office at findvm.com. So, um, you know, we'd love to have you liking our Facebook page. Any questions you have, um, you can email us, check out our website. Um, we're getting more and more content up there, content on our blog. There's so many owners that just want to do a great dog, job for their dog. And you have a lot of invested in your dog, a lot of emotion. And so one of our mottos, um, which have actually trademarked, is move better, feel better, and live longer. And that's what we're all about. Thank you so much. If your dog, if you don't have your dog's attention, then you need to change your approach. So, um, you know, spring is uh, not the best example of a difficult dog because for one, he's half golden and for two, he's done this a hundred times. But in dogs that are, difficult um again you have to step back from your like well we're gonna work on you now and be like what do you like you know if you're just sitting there and you just start rubbing your head or a lot of dogs like their rear ends rubbed my other dog um when he finds a stranger acceptable as soon as he does he um turns his butt to them and uh, asks for a butt rub. So that is really common. So you may have to start with when they're standing, just kind of rubbing their rear and, and then start moving along and figure out well, what do they like and always use less pressure. A lot of my hands are strong and I was a horse vet for a long time. So it looks like I put more pressure than I do, but um, I'm trained in the osteopathic field 
a lot of times my pressure is five to 10 grams. That's the weight of a nickel. And that was hard for me. I had to carry a nickel for probably eight months after I first did that training because it seemed impossible that a nickel worth of weight could do, um, make a big difference, but it really does. And so um, that's how, like if you squeak a toy or get them excited or engaged, that is the opposite of what you're going for. You're going for relaxation. So um, putting canned pumpkin in a mug and letting them lick at, and freezing it um, and uh, letting them lick out of the mug. I don't like Kong toys as much for a lot of reasons, but just a mug and then just the licking motion. You know, you want you want to get them in a more serene mode if you're wanting to to rub on them. Anything spring? I think so. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I'm sorry if I, I spoke too quickly, um, but uh, give us your email and we'll love to send you a little summary. And any questions you have, just reach out to us. Thank you so much.